click it right now. We are officially recording, and I'm going to hand it over to the lady of the hour, Dr. Chin. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to give my uh, introduction just a little bit later on when we show the PowerPoint. Uh, but um, again, I'm just so happy to be a member of the board for 14 years and to um, be with you and Cassie tonight and all of you to talk about diving deeper into revision. Let's just very quickly go around since there's such a nice group of us and tell us uh, your name, what your role is in writing coaches and where you're located perhaps. Rita? Mute. I'm in Whitefish and I've been with the Writing Coaches of Montana since about 2016. And I became the um, the area, the, the Flathead Coordinator in, I think that was 2019. And then um, right when the pandemic started, um, I think uh, that's when um, um, I left uh, as a uh, the, direct, the, the, the coordinator and joined the board. So I've been with the, I've been with the Writing Coaches of Montana for a long time in a variety of capacities. We're so glad you're here, Rita. Thank you, um, Diane. Hi, I'm Diane Elliott. I live in Kalispell and um, first year as a coach. Um, many years as a high school English teacher, and so I'm happy to get back into the classroom. I wish this was available to me. <laughs> when I was teaching because I see so much value in it. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Diane. Julia? Yeah, I'm Julia. I'm from Big Fork, but I'm in Missoula right now for school. And I'm the intern for the year. Yay, we're glad you're here. Yay, <laughs> thank you for all your work. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Love. I live in Corvallis, and this is my second year of uh, being a writing coach. I taught English for oh, seven years um, and then did a lot of work uh, as a journalist and uh, feature writer abroad and have always written for all the work that I've done. So it's important to me and important to work with the kids. Thank you for contributing to writing coaches. That's wonderful. Okay. Hi, Jay. Good evening, I guess it is. I'm Jay. I'm in Whitefish. Just got back from a beautiful day of skiing in the sunshine. I've mm. been uh, with riding coaches for three years. Uh, best part of my day, every day I get to coach with kids because they're just so inspiring. Uh, I've been on the board for not quite a year and, and will be the um, um, president for the time being until the um, until the next election series. Thank you for your leadership and service, Jay. Thank you. Kevin, you're on mute right now. Hi, I'm Kevin Papp. Um, I'm in Missoula. Uh, I'm a first-year writing coach, so I'm just doing this to get some additional training. I apologize for the lack of video. I have a webcam, but I also have two teenagers, so nobody seems to know where it's at right now. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're here with us. I love it. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Jim. You're on mute, Jim. Cassie, do you know anything about how to get Jim on with us? I'm not sure, Jim. I'm asking you to unmute. Are you able to connect to you? There he is. Yeah, I, did, I had done that. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Welcome. I'm, I my I haven't turned the camera on because I'm eating dinner. <laughs> it's not not a pleasant thing to see. I'll join you a little later. Um, I'm a retired physician. I um enjoy writing. I've done uh, various types of writing over the years, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the kids. I just I just think it is fa a fantastic program, and I thoroughly enjoy working with these kids, particularly the nine through twelve. Um, they, they when you when you latch on to someone who sort of gets it and their face lights up, it's just a it's just a remarkable experience for both sides. Beautifully said. And, and again, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Thank you for volunteering uh, to be a member of our writing coaches community. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. I, I And Jim, where are you located? Are you here in Missoula or some other place?
Well, that's okay. Um, let's see. Cassie is going to share the PowerPoint, and because she's such a technical wizard, she's going to be advancing slides and so forth and so on. But, but I would encourage you all to, at any time, raise a question, put it in the chat, which um, Cassie will also be monitoring. I don't see this as in any way a mini lecture so much as an opening for a really wonderful conversation. So um, yay, thank you so much. Yay. And so I called it diving deeper into revising. I am a professor emeritus at the University of Montana, and I'm a 14-year board member. 14 year, no, no, no. I've been on the board since 2014. Right, right, exactly. Time flies when you're having fun. Okay. Um, and that's my contact information. I'm very easy to find, actually. Um, let's see, just a little bit more about me. I have over 40 years of teaching experience, uh, elementary, middle school, high school, two year college and university. I was, uh, I am a board member of Writing Coaches of Montana, and I was president of the National Council of Teachers of English. Some of you may know the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, which is the voluntary licensure for advanced uh, accomplished teachers. And um, some of you may also know about the nation's report card. Every year they come out with reports on how the nation's fourth, sixth and eighth grade, fourth, let's see, fourth, eighth and 12th grade teach students are doing in in our reading and math. And I was in charge of the writing uh, assessments for 2011 and 2017. Both of those assessments preceded Common Core State Standards. So if anyone's interested in the difference between NAEP, the nation's report card, and Common Core Standards, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. And let's see next, Cassie. I'm the author of two textbook series, um, Grammar Workshop and Grammar for Writing, because I think it's very important to integrate um, writing and grammar and grammar and writing. And I speak nationally and internationally um, at uh, conferences for teachers. I also do free videos on teaching, reading, and multicultural literature. So my life is really rich. And even though I'm retired, I'm very active professionally, and I love being part of our professional learning communities. Cassie, is this working for you? Okay, let's go to our next slide then. So as we all know, writing is a dynamic social, recursive, meaning-making pro process. Uh, when we first started teaching the writing process more formally um, in the 1970s, some people were doing these really good stages of the writing process, but some people were pretty much just giving a writing assignment and, of course, assuming the students would write it, write it well, turn it in, and then the teachers would grade it, and the students would get their feedback and kind of go, okay, what's next? So we've learned through the 1970s, through research and classroom teaching best practices, that it's very recursive. In other words, it goes in a circle. And when you're doing pre-writing and then drafting, you might go back to the pre-writing to find out more ideas. Or you're doing pre-writing, drafting, and revising, and then you go back to the pre-writing. So it's very recursive. It's cyclical. And not everybody writes in the same way. Not everybody pre-writes or revises in the same way. And certainly not everybody drafts their writing in the same way. It's writing is very social. We used to think, oh, okay, writing is solitary. You write it, you write it at home, you write it by yourself. If you ask for help from anybody, you're cheating. And we now know that the more we talk about our writing and share our writing and listen to our own writing, we actually make better writing progress and we do better thinking together. So our, our teachers are doing more interactive, social engagement activities with students to make writing come alive because writing is communication and thinking. And we do that very, very importantly with each other to make sure there's an audience and a purpose for our communication. So I like this circle um, because it's very simple, but it also reminds us that it's all connected and that we're each unique in our writing process. And all you have to do is change the writing purpose, the writing topic, the writing audience, the writing genre, and you have a different reading making process going on. Sometimes it's very smooth, sometimes it's a little bit bumpy, and that's what learning is all about. Comments or questions on this graphic? 
feel free to use the chat too, or raise your hand, Kathy can see you, I'm sure. I'm a teacher, so I have long wait times. So <laughs> feel comfortable with that. Okay, well, let's go to the next slide, Kathy. And just go ahead and just, um, hmm. So um, it's very important to have conversations in a safe learning environment. And as you know, writing coaches very much emphasizes that safety, that comfortableness, the building of that relationship with another human being, that that student. Um, revision to be authentic really requires that sense of trust and respect, which is why we use the protocol of praise and then question and then suggest. And I'm hoping that you as coaches are finding that this is a very natural, not a stilted, but a very natural way of having the conversation flow. And that um, that you're feeling very comfortable with how you look for the strengths in a student's writing and writing efforts, and that you're finding questions to help them think about what they're trying to say and what makes sense to them, and to really be thoughtful in their uh, reflections on their paper. And I'm also hoping that you, as writing coaches, are finding that the suggestions you offer make sense to the writer, that the light bulbs go on. Um, when you make a suggestion and they go, oh, I know what to do. I know what I can do. Or they say, well, I, I know that I need to do that, but I'm not quite sure how to get to it. Do you have any suggestions? In which case it opens the door for you to offer um, one or two strategies. Not that you're telling them exactly how to do it, but you're offering them one or two strategies that they can then try out and see what works for them. Writing coaches also wants us to consider What's the writing purpose, the topic, the audience, and the genre? Many times teachers writing assignments will include all of this information. Obviously the topic might be a book they're reading about or a subject in science or a unit in history that they're writing about. Um, the genre could be an essay. It could be um, a, a story. It could be a reflection piece. The genre could be um, a science lab report. So the genre is a particular form of writing that the students are doing. The writing purpose would be to explain, to describe, to argue, to debate. So that's the writing purpose. But sometimes the writing assignments might not include an audience. And that's where we as coaches provide that authentic audience. So just in case the writing assignment didn't say, I want you to imagine you're writing to the school board. I want you to write, imagine you're writing to a magazine editor. I want you to imagine that you're writing to elementary younger children. Um, if it doesn't, um, if the writing assignment doesn't specify an audience, we could ask the, the student, who are you writing to? And often the students say, well, I'm writing to the teacher. And you could say, okay, that's, that's fine, that's good. Is there another audience though that this writing might be also appropriate for? because um, writing for audience and purpose are really important. We change what we say and we change how we say it based on purpose and audience. So that's something to really think about. I'm gonna stop right there. Do you all have any observations or feedback about this one point about purpose, topic, audience, and genre? Beverly, I'm curious, it's more of a question and it combines your last slide, which I was trying to generate my thought and then also about this idea of audience and genre in your long-term experience have you seen a particular type of writing that people are either very intimidated by or not as intimidated by first in teaching because I know teachers sometimes um I don't want to say they're intimidated by teaching writing but it takes a lot of time and energy right have you how have you seen them respond to different types of writing writing prompts over the years and then same with students. Have you seen students sort of recoil or get excited about certain types of assignments? Not that it's up to us, of course, what the curriculum is, but I'm just always kind of curious um, what's, what you've seen work over the years. That's such a an essential question, Kathy, to who we are as educators or who we are as the learner in the classroom. It really varies. I know that in my experience, I was fine with writing for a more objective purpose and audience. And I was less comfortable with writing personal narratives and reflections as a younger middle school, high school person, because 
my upbringing, my cultural upbringing, or just the way I even raised in schooling was to use that third person, you know, um, uh, never use I, never use we. It's always third person, quote unquote, objective report writing, if you will. So I felt very comfortable with writing reports or or writing something more factual. Uh, but I was not comfortable as an individual writer, as a middle school, high schooler, writing with personal narratives, writing about my life. Other students, they would just light up. Oh, I get to write about me, my family, my culture, my experience. So the same thing I think would be true for us as educators or as adults. We will feel differently comfortable with a purpose or a topic or an audience or a genre. And so much of it depends on how we've been raised. It also depends on the topic. If you ask me to write about Buffalo and I don't know much about Buffalo, I might you know, feel differently than someone who is out there watching Buffalo, studies Buffalo, it's part of their culture and their hair. Do you see what I'm saying? So you change the topic or you change the writing purpose in the audience and we will have different resonances with our writing, or we will have different challenges or struggles or ahas with it. So it's so much of it depends on who we are at that time and the context in which we are writing. I also know that traditionally um, high school teachers would often give the first writing assignment, which was what I did on my summer vacation. Do you all remember that? Just kind of thumbs up what I did on my summer vacation. And I think reflecting now as an adult on that writing assignment, I'm thinking some students might have had a fantastic summer vacation, but they weren't going to reveal that vacation to the teacher whom they had just met. So they would invent something else or they would write something really boring or trite. So um, I'm always mindful of um, what are the context, what are the social contexts in which we're asking students to write and to share. Uh, some, some things we think, oh, that's a risky topic. And others is like, Oh, it's very risky for me to reveal something. So uh, did that sort of respond to your question, Cassie? Very much so. Yeah, other thank you. Other people want to respond to it? Did you see any other comments in the chat or any hands going up? Or just feel free to popcorn out, folks. Love to hear your experiences. Hi, Jim. <laughs> I might have a comment to make about this uh, from my experience this past year. Uh, at Columbia Falls, they were they were working with two, well, actually there was in the course of a few days, was, where there were three students, ninth graders. Two were women, young women who were writing about abortion, one pro and one anti. And the third one was fascinating to me because it's a, uh, a delightful young man who's a brilliant student, apparently, um, who is uh, dealing with gender issues uh, on his own and, and with his family and, and uh, classmates. Um, when you have something that is controversial, and you you obviously want to stay out of that person's point of view and and be as direct as possible with with the writing process. Um, there was a sense that what can you do to help me make my position stronger? Mm. And that was challenging for me. Um, because it it involved a lot of getting back to the to the student and saying what what do you think about this and how do you feel about that and then putting it into words. So I guess the question that that I would have is the the difficult topic, which really, in terms of time, because we're always pushed for time, in terms of time you're you're taken away from the writing process uh, into the the topic, the audience, and the genre. Um, and how to how to how to split those two, or how to how to make sure that you spend most of your time as a writing coach, and not as a, a, a social ear listening to current events. 
That's such an important question. And I'm so glad that you're thinking about those relationships. Um, when we are working with our students as, as you are, I think it's really important to have them talk and articulate and discover for themselves what the meat of their message is. Because if they know what the, the main point or the main points in the evidence of their writing or their message is supposed to be, that's why we're such good listeners because talking it aloud helps them articulate and shape what they can then translate into writing. Because it's natural for them to talk through things with you, the good listener, because you're asking questions, you're giving nonverbal feedback, you're nodding your head, and they're encouraged to continue to share and explore. And as they're sharing and exploring, they're really developing what they want to then say in the written message. Sometimes it's very hard for students to just start writing and know what they're going to say. Some, there's a famous quotation about, I don't know what I'm going to say until I write it and read it and see it. Um, so when we're writing coaches, we're encouraging them to talk aloud what their ideas are and why those ideas are important and how would they help their audience understand their main message. So it's, it's almost like we're role playing. Imagine that I'm someone who doesn't understand what you're trying to say. How would you tell that to me? What's the most important thing you want me to learn? from you and your writing. And they go, oh, I got it, I got it. And then they can continue with their writing process. So they're not disconnected. They're very much part of the thinking, writing, reading connection. It's communication. It's been an, inter it was an interesting experience for me, I must say, it was fascinating. I'm so glad you were there for them. I hope you get to go back and, and see what they wrote. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. You're right. So we're focusing on content first, as you know, from our training, and then we work on style. And, and as I just mentioned, content is ideas and organization. If, if we don't have good ideas and, and well-organized ideas, then no matter how beautiful the words are or how fluent the sentences are or how strong the voice is, we lose the important meaning and message, which are the the ideas and organization. And so as, as Jim mentioned, you know, we only have so much time with the students. So let's put our time on the most important things first, which is also why we don't write on students' papers and work on editing. So that's that's really important. And I know that a lot of this you already know because we've gone through the writing coaches training, but I just wanted to bring this up again in case there are ideas or questions that you have as we as we think about revision. Um, let's see. Oh, we have that guide, that one-page guide that's in your um, guide to successful uh, coaching, and it has those suggestions for asking questions. They're never meant to be a checklist. They're meant to be just um, references in case you get stuck on how to ask a question. Uh, I know that most conversations, the questions come naturally because you're such good listeners and because you care so deeply about your students and how they're thinking and articulating their ideas. Um, the next one, oh, connecting readers as writers and writers as readers. So many of our um, students do not see that connection. And that's why we as writing coaches provide that connection. It's like speaking and listening, listening and speaking. It's part of that full circle of communication. And often younger writers do not see the reader at the other end. They don't see the audience. And so it takes a sophisticated individual to, during revision, place themselves in the role of the receiver of the message. And that's what we are doing when we are coaching the students. We are the receivers of the message and we're kind of mirroring, mirroring and echoing to the student what they're saying and asking questions about how clear is it? And is this really what you intend? Or I love the way you say that. That is so powerful. I really like that. So helping the students see reading and writing as going hand in hand, like speaking and listening, that's where our research shows that we have the most growth in thinking and writing performances. Otherwise, students just write, they put all their ideas on the paper and they say, okay, you're the teacher, you're the reader. If it doesn't make sense, you figure it out. Or you take it home, you fix it, give it back to me, and then I'll re recopy it. And that's not really thinking. That's not really supporting students as writers or as readers, or as thinkers. 
I just wanted to hop in and reiterate something that you just said there, Beverly, which is so important. The idea of finding the strengths in the paper, um, because not only, I think it kind of goes both ways, not only do anyone, but also students have a hard time seeing their readers, but I think they also, like we talked about before, have a hard time taking a step back and realizing that writers are thinkers. A lot, I'm sure, raise your hand if you've worked with one of our students as a coach and they've said, I'm not a good writer. Have you ever come? Yeah, everyone. Yeah, exactly. I hear that. I don't know. It, you know, maybe every other session from someone. So a lot of folks think that they're not good writers. And that's what's so exciting. I think about our roles to come in and help with that process. And once we listen to their ideas and we go, oh, that's brilliant, because there's always a gem in there somewhere, right? There's always passion about something usually. Um, we get to help them understand that that's step one in the writing process. So it's like there's three roles almost. There's like thinker, writer, reader, and they all have, again, sort of a recursive relationship like we were talking about before in their roles. So thank you, Beverly. You're always helping me sort of clarify how to help students see themselves as writers instead of having it be a very scary word. So thank you. And, and when we thank you so much. And when we ask people, how many of you consider yourself a good reader? More people raise their hands than when you ask those same people, how many of you consider yourself a good writer? So there is that connection of confidence. Um, but, but again, reading is receptive and writing is productive. And um, it, it, there's a, an important connection, but writing is another step forward, if you will. Uh, another sense of responsibility. But we talk about helping students be critical readers and effective writers, and, and those just go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. It's just like being a, a, an effective speaker and a really thoughtful listener and, and an active listener. And those two things go hand in hand as well. But if if we don't model it in the classroom and if we don't model it as writing coaches, then we lose that opportunity to, to support and empower our students as thinkers and as communicators. So that's why writing coaches is so, so wonderfully important because we model this in a very natural, safe, personal way. Ultimately, in our last bullet there, ultimately we are empowering students to take ownership and responsibility in their, um, in their message. Is that coming up, Cassie? Um, it is. I was just, Jay was raising his hand. So I would love for oh, him hi, to Jay. hop in now. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Still muted, Jay. <laughs> Got that. So we're talking about readers and writers and thinkers. But we also should be thinking about speakers, because as we have people speak loud, that seems to me to be a very, for some people, as we talked about earlier as audience, and a fairly important part. And they might not be good writers or might be good readers, but they might really be very, um, very good talkers. And take that and try to make some as a strong point and bring that into making them a better writer through speaking. This seems maybe another another part of that whole component. Well, you're absolutely right, Jay, because speaking and listening and reading and writing are all forms of thinking communication, right? It, it, it's all part of that same um, human endeavor, if you will. And that's why we, we emphasize in writing coaches the speaking and listening. They read aloud their paper, we listen, we have conversations so they can then take ownership of their own writing. A lot of times I know as coaches, we say, that was a great idea, write it down. I love the way you just said that main idea, write it down. Uh, because I think so many uh, so many of us, myself included, when I say it, I go, that's what I mean. Okay, got to write it down before it escapes my memory. Um, and I think that that's so important because you're absolutely right. Speaking and listening and reading and writing all go hand in hand. And different students will have different strengths based on what they're studying and learning. A lot of times students will say, can't I retell the story to you as opposed to write a book report? Can't I um, demonstrate to you that I know how to fix this as opposed to write out the directions on how to fix something? Um, and so how do we build on that oral language competence and translate it into written language competence when appropriate? So I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, speaking, listening, reading, and writing, um, and they can all be uh, supported 
with more activities and, and more experiences in the school. Fear of public speaking and fear of flying used to be two of number two of America's number one fears, right? I mean, they used to do these uh, surveys of America's fears and fear of flying and fear of public speaking. That may have changed, you know, recently um, since the COVID um, years, but um, I think now the students may not be as afraid of public speaking because they're doing Zoom and they're doing all kinds of social media and so forth. But you never know. I go to lots of meetings and they say, please use the microphone. And they go, no, I don't want to use a microphone. Um, you know, I go, please, I need to hear you. So, yeah, thank you, Jay, uh, for that. That's really important. Ultimately, we do want students to grow in their competence and confidence in writing and thinking, any form of communication, speaking and listening. There's a lot of research that shows that students who are in debate are good writers as well because they have to articulate and provide evidence for their position, be it pro or con, yes or no. So uh, I know that in freshman composition at the university, people who have had speech debate experience um, perform better in writing um, in, in freshman comp, which is a wonderful connection as well. I'm just going to hop in really quick because I think, again, you said such an important thing right there, Beverly. The word experience, I, I think it's just so important as coaches, as people who support young people, no matter where they're at to never get mistaken that what we see on the paper and the product is necessarily equivalent to someone's intelligence or ability. It has so much more to do with what type of experiences they've had in their lives that have prepared them to understand that this is a skill set, right? Mm -hmm. And that they need to learn how to do it, apply it in many different genres and many different experiences with many different audiences to get any good at it. And if you haven't mm -hmm. had a lot of experience for a million different reasons, right? Um, we just never want to make that mistake because this truly is a skill set. And I'm just, I'm so thankful that all of you help students in understanding that about themselves. Cause ultimately, you know, I used to teach as an adjunct at UM in the sociology department. I can't tell you how many people thought they were dumb. Um, and these are young people that also grown, you know, adults, adult learners. And it was because they never got taught this skill set. So, I mean, it's, it's a life changer being able to communicate like this. I appreciate that uh, reminder that people have different abilities in writing and you change the genre, you change the purpose, you change the topic or the audience and they will grow and grow in different ways. And if you have a different purpose, audience, topic, or genre, I mean, I can, I can write about teaching writing or teaching reading or teaching multicultural literature or, or how to create learning environments. And I can go on and on and on and on and on about that. But you say, okay, Beverly, now I want you to talk about downhill skiing. And I kind of go, I love to watch it, <laughs> you know, because I don't have any um, positive experience <laughs> with downhill skiing. I'm like many of you who just got off the ski slope this afternoon, um, but I'm a great admirer of you all. So again, it's that difference between my experience and my knowledge and my confidence. Um, and then you change it to nuclear physics and I'm gonna go up oh, way out of my league there folks. So um, yeah, we have to be really mindful. Sometimes students are beautiful in writing poetry and not so good in writing an argumentative piece or vice versa. They're really good in an, an expository research piece but not so good in writing a personal narrative. And so we have to give students those opportunities to grow and take risks and to try things out. So I, I this um, chart is from one of my ebooks called Teaching Meaningful Revision. And again, if you haven't had a chance to look at those ebooks, they're only um, all about eight to twelve pages long. They're not very long at all. They're very uh, user friendly, I think. And uh, a lot of schools use them as um, jumping off points for some of their professional learning discussions on writing and revising and editing and grammar. So I created this chart that um, enables us to think about these four questions. And the first set of questions deals with, how do you feel when you are asked to give feedback to another person's writing? And then the alternative to that question is, how do you feel when another person gives you feedback on your writing? So that's the affective domain. And then the next part of those questions would be what types of feedback are helpful for you? Why? What types of feedback are not helpful for you? Why? I thought you might just take a few moments and take any one of those 
squares, if you will, and just jot down a few ideas and then we'll we'll share them out in just a moment. This won't take too long. I'm just curious about this because our experiences inform sometimes how we feel and think when we're in that coaching situation. Does everyone have, did everyone have a chance to write something down in one of those four boxes? Okay, so this is just voluntary. Uh, would anyone like to share uh, briefly what you said in the first box? How do you feel when you were asked to give feedback to another person's question? Jay, is that a hand up? You're muted, Jay. Got it, okay. Um I'm really careful because what I really want to make sure is that within offering feedback, I am helping instill some some confidence and encouragement um, to help them with the writing and their critical thinking. So careful is the word I use to make sure I'm treading on the right side of being making this very positive while trying to help them think. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing. Would anyone else like to share with uh, that first box? And Cassie, maybe you can see hands going up. Rita, and then I think Jim might have just. Go ahead, Rita. Well, Beverly, I am so glad that you are going over this slide here. Um, I'm going to answer the um, ask, when asked to give feedback. You know, my gut response is not the appropriate one. I mean, my initial gut response is so inappropriate and I just have to recalibrate and re-gear and get my mind in the right place, which is what you just discussed on the previous slide. Mm. And th that takes time and it causes me great stress. And I would like to be more fluid in my coaching. And this is why I'm here tonight. Um, I had uh, this is the last coaching session, uh, 15 minutes with the students. And I was a wreck at the end of two periods. And so if you have any suggestions on how to take a dive, a deeper dive into the student's reading when time is limited and I feel overwhelmed on where to begin. Rita, first of all, just thank you for that honesty. And, and you are not alone. Believe me, you are not alone. Is there, I want to ask about the timing. 15 minutes is a very short piece of time for a student to be reading to us as a coach and for us to have any kind of a meaningful, focused conversation. Is there a reason why 15 minutes was the time frame? I think it's getting the... Uh, uh, um the greatest number of students in, uh, next to a coach as possible. Given the time, uh, and these were uh, uh, 50, 45 or 50 minute ses um, periods, classroom periods. So I think it's given the amount of time that the uh, teacher wants to take with coaches, ex for example, uh, one, one draft only, not a second draft the next week. And uh, so it's just the number of students and the time allowed. Right. Um, I think that might be a conversation of logistics, because if um, if it's so short that the student is just reading aloud and we're barely having a chance to read and process, then are we really doing um, 
revising, if you will, right? As opposed to just listening to a first draft. Another part of it is how long is the piece of writing? If it's a one paragraph, as opposed to a one page, as opposed to a three page, that all makes a, a really big difference. So if it was if it was one paragraph, or I'm just going to read you the introduction, um, or I'm going to read you the introduction and the conclusion, even still 15 minutes for an introduction and conclusion is fast. But you know, if I only had to write a, a, um, a paragraph, then I would be saying, okay, is this really an important paragraph and why are we spending time revising it? So it goes back to the teacher and the timing. And maybe that's a question that we should follow up, Cassie, you and me, um, and Rita sometime, because um, that you, we have to have enough time. I'm not saying every student gets an hour, because that's not reasonable either. But um, if all we're doing is getting to hear, hear the student read aloud and we don't have a chance to have a conversation, then we really aren't engaging in authentic revision. Beverly, I think you're right. And I think you're right. It does come down to logistics. And most often, if we're ever down to that number, it's because we don't have enough coaches who signed up. So instead of having 25 minutes per coach with each student, we have to cut down the time. So as I put in the chat, we are always recruiting for new coaches. So please tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbor. Um, we need as many people as possible to give that really meaningful conversation the time it requires. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Rita. Um, and again, I have empathy with your initial reaction. Thank you so much for sharing. And then Jim yes, just raised his hand okay, as well. Okay, good. Hi, Jim. I completely agree with what what uh, both Jay and Rita have said. And I was as I read through these four yeah, possibilities that you have on the screen, how you react as an adult and how you re react as a as a, a, a writing coach are two completely different things. Um, as a writing coach, I think I think we've all experienced the same problem that has just been brought up and that Cassie just put on the screen. The if if the time is cut short and the number of coaches available have been cut short for whatever reason. There's an intimidation factor on both sides because the coach is not feeling that he or she is able to do what they came to do. And on the student side, they don't quite know where to start. Some students read slowly and we only have 10 minutes and the first five are taken to get through the first few sentences or paragraphs. So that's a logistical problem. And I, uh, I was going to ask Cassie at some point about how do you, how do you market this program and and uh, how do what's the best way to try to recruit uh, additional coaches it's a wonderful program but when the time period is contracted uh, to a point where it's more confusing to a student than it is helpful to a student then you have to sit back and say okay what have I done and and how can I let this child, this eighth grader or the ninth grader, walk away? I, I need I need twenty minutes to explain uh, where to go with this or how to help you go with. It. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating, and and I don't I don't have the answer, and I'm sure Cassie deals with this question all the time. But uh, some form of recruitment might be helpful statewide. So appreciate that honesty, Jim, because, you know, it's it. I understand that you all give your time as a resource and to be set up to not be able to do that effectively is very frustrating. Um, and so, um, yeah, I could talk at you a million miles a minute right now about our strategic plan that we came up with and how we're trying to execute better communications and recruitment and all the things that we're trying to do on the back end. Um, but it does take time to build that up. And just so you know, um, all of you, we consider you partners, not only in the classroom, but in general, you put a lot into this organization. So if you ever have ideas or feedback or anything about this, please be in touch with me. This is my full-time job now that Cats on the ground in Missoula and River Valley is figuring out exactly that question. How do we 
build up a community that's going to give us a sustainable organization so we can do the really important work that happens in the classroom. So um, I'm happy to give you more details at a different time. And just know open door policy and, and feedback is always welcome because without community, local community members, this ship does not run. Um, so you know your communities best and I'm always open to feedback and building relationships to make it happen. So thank you. I appreciate this conversation because, as you know, I've been in Montana for 40 years and I've been involved with lots of state accreditation standards for both educators and programs. And at one time we had uh, something called the Significant Writing Classroom, which uh, had a class size limit so that teachers would have a small class size so they could teach writing well. That's gone by the wayside now. But if you think about a teacher having that many students individually, trying to help every individual with these different kinds of learning styles, right? That's why I said, what types of feedback are helpful for you? Because sometimes people say, I love it when the teacher wrote all over my paper. And other people go, oh, no, I shut down when I got all that feedback. It was all red ink. So I really wanted us to look at both the affective experiences that we've been raised with, as well as the cognitive experiences with what really helped us become a better writer. And when did it all click? Because for me, it didn't click until much, much later. And then when it clicked, it was like all right there. But up until that time, it's like peace here, peace there. Peace. And the whole thing didn't click until I actually had a real purpose for writing and a real audience. So is, is there anybody else who wants to share anything on any of the other boxes? Maybe some of the people we haven't heard from, Diane or Chris or Kevin? I, I have a comment I'd like to make. Um, Hi, Chris. And this, this really... Um, goes into another area as well. But when I'm, when I'm thinking about the shortage of time, um, one of the things that occurs to me is to ask the student, what do you most want help with right now? What is the, what is the piece of this that, you know, you, you feel good about and where, where do you uh, think you need to do some work that maybe I could help you with? And this kind of leads me to the broader question of, of empowering the student, I'm finding as I think about it, I get so plugged into the rubric or the writing instructions that we are given and I kind of start marching through it. And I realize I'm driving this conversation um, related to what the teacher is looking for. And I really want to learn how to pull back more so that they own the experience more and they're kind of asking for what they want, however I can bring that about. I love that, Chris, because first of all, it honors the fact that the writer is the writer and is in a certain point in time in their thinking, creating, writing process. And I think that you just honor that individual so beautifully when you ask them, what would you like to focus on? What can I be of most help to you on. And you're following the student and, and following the student's lead. And I think that's just absolutely beautiful and it's natural. And well, it's I don't think I'm doing it enough. So I'm I'm that's an aspirational goal, really. Because I, I as I say, it's easy to get caught up in the the assignment. And um I find myself leading and of course, that, that's part of what we're there for is to structure the conversation. But um, anyway, that's what I'm chewing on right now is how to invite them to own the process a little more. Well, and I think that that's exactly what, what we want you to do. And, you know, when the student and you both know what the assignment is and you, you say, what is it that I can help you with as you work on this assignment? You are being focused on the assignment, but you're enabling the student to articulate and to prioritize where he or she would like to have your help. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a beautiful, natural way to mentor a student, to coach a student. I think that that's wonderful. Yeah. And Rita I think had for me, the one thing oh, that- Go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead, um, kind of along these same lines is that is figuring out where each student is and, and trying to do that quickly. It gives some anxiety because, you know, some kid may come in with almost nothing on their paper and five minutes in, you realize, okay, this kid is very capable and, you know, we can have this type of discussion. Whereas another kid, you're maybe giving something that's a little bit too much for them early. And that 
almost sours the relationship. So kind of finding where they're at as soon as possible is something I've, I've struggled with. So. What I appreciate with what you just said, Kevin, is you're, you're discovering with the student what's appropriate at that time, because you're absolutely right. Every, every writer, every learner, every student is in a different part, in a different place with this assignment and the writing. And you're asking them and you're figuring out with them, where are they? If they didn't bring anything on the sheet of paper, okay, how can we get started? How can I help you get started? Or if they have a pretty good first draft, you're asking them again, okay, what can we do? What do you want to do during this time frame? So I think you're right on with that because you're being individual and you're being, if you will, diagnostic on what the student um, understands needs to, needs to happen or wants to have happen. Sometimes we think we know what needs to happen. The student has a different point of view. I want to follow the student's lead. Did you see Rita had her hand up? Go ahead, Rita. One of the first questions I ask when I sit down with a student is, what would you like to focus on today? Is there anything you're struggling with? So I, try, I, I do try to pinpoint what area the student might like to focus on. And I would say two thirds of the time, they have no idea on what needs to be focused on. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm thinking through this, it might help to know how we might draw that information out of the student. You know, how can we help them discover what they might need the most help on? Mm. Or would that be um, a waste of time given how much time we have? And should we just go right into them starting their, you know, reading their piece and starting the coaching process? I well, found some, if I can sp I'll speak again, yeah. I, I found sometimes that they actually, the reading does, they start to discover ellipses in their writing or, you know, things that they haven't said the way they want to say. Um, so sometimes that can be a help to discover, they'll notice but they yeah. want to be differently. It's just one thing. And, and it's not like an either or, because sometimes the student sort of knows, but doesn't know, not know how to articulate it to, you, to us, right? That's like, well, I, I know I need to do something, but how do I say it, right? So sometimes by reading it aloud, they discover it. And sometimes they just say, I don't know, you're the expert, you know, you tell me. And they're looking for you to take the guide, take the lead. And if they are, then you can say, well, so, so what do you think the big idea is of this writing assignment? What do you think you're trying to accomplish with it? Hmm. Okay, well, let's see how you're doing. Why don't you start reading aloud and let's see how you're doing with that. So you're doing a both and, not an either or. Because it's sort of like, you know, if someone says to me, well, what do you think about your piece of writing right now? I'm kind of like, well, I don't know. You know, that's why I'm sharing it with you. You tell me. <laughs> and that's a perfectly normal, natural response for, for some people because they know they need help, but they aren't quite sure how to ask for it or what to ask for because they don't have that language yet. And so through the writing coaches, we're giving them, we're offering them that language, we're reinforcing that language. Um, we're hearing the language that the student has internalized from the classroom practice. There's all kinds of positive things, but sometimes they really, really don't know because they're not, um, they're not aware yet of what they're doing well or what they're not yet doing well. And so they're relying on us to be a coach, to be a mentor, to be a guide. And that's okay. Jay had his hand up, so I'll have him go next. And I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. It's two minutes until 6.30 uh -huh. and I want to honor your time. So um, anyone who wants to stick around, I'm delighted that you all want to do such a deep dive. Anyone who needs to get going, totally understandable. And we'll just keep going until you all want to leave us. <laughs> so go ahead, Jay. Uh -huh. So and I, I'm listening to, to Rita and, and others, and, and I think that's a, a really important question. Where do you want to start? And sometimes something that's worked for me is, is to ask them, what do they think is the best part? What do they really like about what they've done so far? And so that if they have some, and that gets some thinking on a positive standpoint, then you can kind of go, well, how is that different than the part that's hard for you to work on? And, and they, they can start looking internally into, wow, I like this and not that. I wonder what that is. So it's, sometimes it helps them start thinking about what they like and what the, the challenging parts are. So I tend to take the, the positive view of what do you really think you've done well? I'm then reinforcing that to them. 
You know, I think that that's absolutely fantastic because it it points to the strengths and the student builds their confidence. Oh, wow, somebody's asking what's going well as opposed to what's not going well. Um, but but it also requires them to reflect and articulate whether they think they have good word choices or they think they have a good opening sentence or they think that they really understood the, the uh, assignment or they thought they had three good ideas or if we really get an insight, we are being diagnostic again as, as um, you're asking that question, Jay. You're finding out whether they have an awareness of their own writing strengths so that we can then reinforce when they're reading it aloud and say, wow, you're absolutely right. I can see that you you do know that you're doing this well. You do know that you're doing that well. Wow, that's a, a remarkable understanding of yourself as a writer. Keep up that good work. Now, now let's transition to how this next part can even be stronger, just like those other parts. So yeah, good work on that, Jay. Really good work. Um, so I, I have those four just for you to reflect on your own writing experiences as a as a um, person who gives feedback and receives feedback and what's worked for you in the past and what hasn't. And again, that's in my ebook, which um, you're welcome to read at your leisure. So, um, and I do this in my classes too, and they always compare and contrast. Oh, I love this. I hated that, you know. Different people had good experiences or not good experiences when they got certain kinds of feedback. Uh, let's see, next slide, go ahead. So in the classroom, there are other ways that teachers teach revision. I just thought I'd show you some of them. Obviously we do the author reads aloud to partner. Sometimes partners read aloud to the author. Sometimes they exchange papers and sometimes we do a round robin read. But those are different ways that a classroom teacher might do it. But in all of these, um, you have to model it to make sure students are doing appropriate feedback and that um, somebody isn't just red inking all over the place. So um, any other comments? I, I know we've only had an hour together, um, but revision is at the heart of improving thinking, reading, writing, and communicating. And re teaching revising in the classroom or from a classroom teacher's perspective, and those of you who are experienced classroom teachers of English perhaps will agree with me, teaching revising is really a challenging but rewarding part of the English language arts. Um, Diane, you were an English teacher and um, Chris, you were an English teacher. Would you agree that the teaching of revision, first of all, engaging students in revision and getting them to want to revise might be two really important aspects of, of our curriculum and pedagogy in English? Chris, I see you nodding your head. Oh, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I used to create a little writing improvement chart where they list their own, I'd give them some feedback of strengths and weaknesses on the top of their paper. They would record those and then I'd invite them to choose the weaknesses as goals for the next paper. Wonderful. And yeah, we did a lot of revising. I, it is, so many kids, I think, think you just slam it down and, you know, that's it. But yeah, one and done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one and done, exactly. Not one and exactly. done. Yeah. Or, or they don't leave enough time to write the draft, to let it sit and re re revisit it with fresh eyes from the eyes of the intended audience because our lives are so busy. And, and again, that's why writing coaches originally wanted to have two meetings with the same student to see how the suggestions and how the growth and how the try it this way, try it that way, see how it works because. So often the students will just write one draft and, and you know, wow, we're going to do revising one meeting with the coach. That's better than none. But my gosh, to have a second meeting with the same coach to see how it actually works is fantastic. But I know everybody has busy lives. I just know that. Um, but I'm working on an article right now and I'm thinking, doesn't it get any faster or easier? And the answer is, no, because it's a new writing task, a new writing audience, a new writing purpose and topic and genre. So I just grapple with it because I'm used to it now. <laughs> and I won't give up persistence, writing persistence, knowing that I will make it and having support all along the way. So that's what we're here to do is to support you as you support the coaches um, with each other, with the teachers, with the students. Um, I just love being part of our community. And Cassie, if you show the last slide, uh, for those of you who um, haven't had a chance to go, these are free ebooks. Uh, there are other ebooks out there too that I've written on grammar and uh, elementary and middle school and, and so forth. But I thought these two might be the most appropriate. Again, they're only about 10 or 12 pages and they're very uh, user-friendly. They have lots of 
um, good ideas that are, are easy to implement for a teacher or for us as coaches. And um, writing coaches do support Montana standards with uh, the written language uh, standards. And everything that we do is supportive. And I just so, I'm just so impressed with writing coaches as our nonprofit organization. I'm just so proud of all the work that you do. And I compliment you and commend you for your commitment to students and literacy in our community. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Cassie, are you still there? Can I am me? still here, yes. I'm going to. I'm fairly ignorant of what I'm about to bring up. And Great, so, go for it. <laughs> I, has there been any effort since you, since beginning the writing coach concept and growing the, the writing coach uh, across the state? Has anyone written a guide for parents to help children learn to write? Is there is there a, a simplified, easy to read uh, format that parents can participate with the writing coaches mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. What did you do today, Johnny? Oh, I met with so and so, and I learned to write this paragraph. Oh, let me read your paragraph, and isn't that wonderful? And let's read the next one because I know you couldn't spend the whole day with your writing coach. Sure. And. It just seems that there a symbiotic relationship with yeah. the writing coaches, particularly on the day of the event, yeah. could be very helpful at home. And it, it could yeah. be a very positive thing for both parent and child. It's a great point, Jim. There's a couple of important things that you mentioned. Well, first of all, the research shows that collaboration between teacher, community, family, that is a recipe for success for children. They need support relationally in order to achieve academically. So you're absolutely hitting the nail on the head there and seeing those parties collaborate. We all care about your skill development. We all care about you and your ideas as a person. That sets a student up for having that emotional safety that we talked about that is a requirement in order to learn how to write or do anything academically or intellectually. So that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Um, my predecessor, Diane Benjamin and Beverly actually put together during COVID a very short guide when the first pan when the pandemic first started for parents because parents were home in a role that they had never been in before, where they were essentially asked to be part-time teachers in some ways, right? So we do have a very short guide that was sort of honed to at-home learning and online learning. But like you said, um, you know, with marketing and communications and all those things. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that we can tweak that and just make it a general guide that's not necessarily for online learning and bring that back into our resource hub because that's one of our goals as an organization in this strategic plan that we are aiming to execute in the next four-ish, four and a half years to become a statewide organization. We want to be known as a literacy writing hub of resources for parents, teachers, students, other nonprofits to come and um, to be, you know, expert helpers on all of these things. So thanks for bringing that up. I'm going to put it on my to-do list. That's awesome. Yeah. 